Hey there, CareBlazer. Welcome back to another episode of CareBlazers TV. I am so excited about this week's episode because we have a very special guest with us. Her name is Mary Jo Johnson Gibbons, and she is going to talk about when and how to make that very difficult nursing home transition. So if you've been thinking about nursing home care for your loved one, or you're wondering about how to make that decision and if it's right for you, this is gonna be a video that you're gonna find so helpful. Mary Jo, I'm so happy that you're willing to give us your time and help all the care blazers out there. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, and so besides Mary Jo being um, an amazing advocate for dementia caregivers, having a master's degree in public administration, a bachelor's degree in therapeutic recreation, Mary Jo has a very personal connection to dementia, and I think that's really gonna shine through when she talks to everybody. So um, you care for your father with Alzheimer's disease, correct? That's correct. I was um, deep in my profession already, and I was in the midst of actually designing a memory care facility when my dad used to joke with all his friends that I was building it for him, when in reality, he was the very first person that I moved into the, into the memory care facility with me. So my profession turned deeply personal, and my passion took on a whole new meaning when it's your very own father. So now, this many years later, each and every one that I serve is just like my own parent. So I'm so um, privileged to have had that experience because I think it made me um, better at what I do today just because of having the personal experience. Oh, absolutely. No doubt. I mean, I just think that is such a neat thing. You know, um, Mary Jo has been involved in planning and creating and developing several assisted living centers. And the fact that you were able to create one and be involved in one that your own father ended up going to, I just think that's such a touching and amazing story and really um, would show that you take pride and care and really are thoughtful in terms of what needs to happen how does an assisted living facility need to be? Like this is not just a random person with dementia, it's your own family member. And the fact that you can carry that through with everybody else who comes through is so nice. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you also have, you're a co-owner of the Stone Lodge Memory Center. Tell us That's a little bit about that. Well, Stone Lodge is my first venture of going into ownership. And the reason I did that is because when, when I'm, um, working for a corporation, obviously there's a lot of can'ts, don'ts, and won'ts, and things like that. And so I was excited to be able to create a facility that I wanted to show was a better way, a right way, my way to, to kind of do this without all of the limitations and restrictions. So in being an owner, I was able to be as creative as possible, and especially like even the room that I'm sitting in is one that um, was very important to me, which is a sensory room. And most facilities wouldn't dedicate that kind of space to something like this. And so I was fortunate enough that with my vision, I was be able to inspire um, my co-partners um, to be able to follow through with what we wanted to create with the best environment possible. Yeah, I think it's amazing, you know, because I think a lot of times when people think about nursing home care or assisted living facility care, they kind of picture a very kind of cold, harsh, not a therapeutic environment, almost like a very sterile, kind of sad place to send a family member. But watching your video of the Stone Lodge Center and just how homey and cozy it feels, like it has to make family members feel more comfortable that they're sending their loved one to a home, not just a facility, and also absolutely would help with a lot of the anxieties and behaviors that somebody with dementia would have transitioning to a different environment. There are three really key ingredients that I say for a memory care facility, um, and those three first and foremost, but you have to have each and every one because you can't have one without the other because um, they really um, go all together. But first of all is the environment, and it really is about um, what are they seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, feeling, you know, in that space. What are they experiencing? Uh, just as you and I and we want to make sure that we're evoking the greatest amount of comfort and pleasure and and the right amount of stimulation and, and the feeling of home so here at Stone Lodge I made sure that there was nothing that was 
indicative of an institution or a clinical medical setting because we're really all about focusing on the person and not the disease. And it's really about wellness, not illness. So the environment plays a key, key role in that. And so with that said, anything um, that is health related, because we do do a lot of that, is more the behind the scenes and it's not the main focus of the environment. So when I did Stone Lodge, I was kind of on the kick of creating a vacation resort setting. Oh, yeah. They have dementia doesn't mean they should be deprived of going on vacation. Absolutely. They always plan in their golden years, you know. And so I was really um, set on trying to create a place that felt more like they were on vacation than in an institution. So the second thing that's really important besides environment is the program. There's many, many facilities out there that hang a sign, have a beautiful facility, and say that they're a memory care, but yet they have no program to support it. And uh, that's really the heartbeat of it um, as far as you have to have a program, and in our case, it's very relational and very individualized, meaning that life histories drive what our program is. And so most of ours is really about how we create the greatest degree of meaning and purpose for a person based on their previous lifestyle um, routines and habits and likes and dislikes. And so we're always, um, you know, focusing on how best to have that individual enjoy the moment in the space that they're in. So then lastly, the third element that is really critical is the relationships. And so that's about the staff that are hired there, that are trained there, and the staff that have a passion um, for this kind of work. And because it really is about living with them, not just working here. Yeah. So it's living life with these individuals. And so I'm so blessed to be able to have a team of caregivers that are just top notch because they have the heart for this. So those are the three elements. I love it. I love that it's an individualized approach, no, not a one size fits all. You take time to get to know the people who are living in your facility, and then you also take time to make sure you're hiring people who actually want to be a part of the family and be a part of the team and not necessarily just collect a paycheck because, you know, as you know, it can be, there's a lot of challenges that go along in providing this type of care, and if your heart's not in it. Right. Well, I often say, and when I'm hiring individuals to join our team, um, it is interesting how many that come to me that have a personal experience themselves. And so those caregivers already have like a, a step up on others because they've experienced it personally like myself. But I always say that it takes a tremendous amount of mind, body, and spirit to care for another person's mind, body, and spirit. So the um, characteristics of a caregiver in a, in a memory care setting um, very much um, where there's certain characteristics that they have to be really strong in. And, yeah. and you can tell which ones um, have that and which ones don't, so. Yeah. Wonderful. So how about we talk about this, you know, really, this it's a struggle for a lot of family members in terms of, you know, how to even decide whether their loved one needs to transition to a higher level of care. Like, can you help walk us through, like, how do they even begin this process? Yeah, I would have to say it's one of the most frequently asked questions as far as how and when do you really make that decision about moving someone out of their home into a normalized care setting, and that is the toughest decision ever. And all those decisions as to the why, the when, the where, the how, um, really so dependent upon unique and individual and specific circumstances and factors of every person's situation because the, each and every one is different. But I will tell you that as we're making that critical decision, just like you would with any life decision, you know, you're going to weigh the pros and cons. And I would have to say that there are three most common mm, reasons that people look at when they need to make such a transition into a formalized setting. First and foremost is usually safety and security. Um, and as you know, with this disease process, that there are times when safety has to be really taken into consideration from the standpoint of the individual with Alzheimer's and uh, related dementia and or the caregiver. And so when we look at that, there are many things that can be done in the home to try to address some of those as far as 
um, how you modify the home for some of those unsafe situations. That's one of them then to really evaluate where are we in regards to the amount of um, concern for safety. Secondly is health. Health as far as emotional, physical, mental health of not only the individual with the disease, but with the caregiver as well. And so when you're looking at that, you have to really figure out if the caregiver is going to be so compromised with your own health, then maybe that's part of where you're weighing the pros and cons for making such a decision. Lastly, I think it's about the level of care needs. And so when you're looking at the level of care, it really is dependent upon whether or not that caregiver can adequately provide that care from a physical standpoint, even if their loved one were to have a fall and how they would get back up or the amount of weight in transferring their loved one. And if that caregiver has the strength to be able to do that, sometimes it really does take two people to provide the care in a safe manner um, for both the caregiver and the care receiver. So the three things, the safety, the health, and the level of care that we look at as far as when people are coming to us and we're helping them through that decision. Yeah, that's why I always say it's really hard. You know, you can't compare yourself to another caregiver. You know, because those three factors are huge. It's not just about you're caring for a loved one with dementia. Even if both of you are caring for a loved one with moderate dementia, it's about, you know, the safety, their functioning. You as a caregiver, like, how are you doing emotionally? What kind of help do you have around you? So, you know, you just got to stay away from the comparison game. And it really is about all those individual factors, like you just mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, Natalie, if I could share just a little bit, I know that when an individual is trying to make that decision about the transition, there's so many sources out there. Obviously, we live in a world where information is readily available at our fingertips, and there's, there's referral agencies, and there's tools and assessments. Like, I jump online sometimes just to see what the latest and greatest is, and there's evaluation tools that you can do yourself and do like a checkoff to see where you are in making that kind of decision, um, that kind of helps walk you through it as well. I, I want to caution just a little bit about some of the referral agencies, only because um, it's it's nice to have their support and help, but always know that oftentimes they're uh, being paid by an, another you know facility. And so, with that said, um, you might not always be given the best um, referral as much as it might be one that it's because it's one of their providers that they have to refer you to. So I just throw that caution out there. And the, and the greatest thing when ever making a decision about places, like we have a tour going on right now where I am and the family comes in and, and we give them a checklist. And I think the checklist is really, really wonderful for a family to have to be able to check off all the things to make sure that they're asking all the right questions and make sure that um, your job as a caregiver is trying to find the best match for yeah. your family and you. I always say with my family members, it's really not about being a handoff. It's about being a handshake. How can, oh. how can we be here now to help support you? It doesn't mean that your responsibility is over. It just means that it's transition, transition changing because that's what places like myself having here at Stone Lodge that's what we're here for, so that your visits can be much higher quality and you can enjoy the time with your loved one instead of being so exhausted and worn out with having to provide the physical and emotional care when we're right here to help you with it. Absolutely. It's not about just like totally handing somebody over. Your, your families are still very much an important part of the picture. Absolutely. We even have um, a form and we talk with families about setting up their expectations and writing those expectations down for us because we can't meet or exceed them if we don't know. And we want to know those moments of joy that you still want to continue as a family member so that we don't take that over for you because yeah. it's special for you to continue doing. And so it's really all about that communication with um, the facility in which you choose um, so that you have a relationship where it's all about how you coordinate the care and, and all of that, you know, with the facility and with the family and so on and so forth. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like you have a really great, like, personal approach. 
at your facility, which is wonderful. I know not all of them are like that. Um, it, it is, it highlights a really important point. When you are at the point of, you know, placing your loved one at a higher level of care, not only is that super challenging for your loved one with dementia who might be confused and scared and anxious and all the normal feelings that go along with that, but it's also pretty difficult for that caregiver to hand their loved one and even if they were so stressed out prior, you know, still like handing over that care and responsibility and trust in an entire like other person is so scary that it's nice you take the time to kind of talk to them about what they still want to keep some control yeah. over. Yeah. The other thing that I really like that we've been doing a lot of, and I hope other facilities would also realize the benefit of it, but when we talk about transition, uh, there's, there's two of them in my opinion. There's a planned transition, which is obviously the most preferred, and then there's an unplanned transition. So if I can tell you about a planned transition, um, let me share with you what I think that could be. That could look like either a gradual process or it could be an establish a target date and that's move-in day. And some families, for their specific reasons, prefer one over the other. Now, a gradual one, obviously, would be most ideal, but being that um, we don't live in a perfect world, right, um, we have learned here that we want to be able to customize so whatever's best for that family. So let me give you an example of that. Um, if the individual um, and their caregiver are doing quite well at home, but maybe the caregiver needs a little bit more respite, and maybe the care receiver is bored, and doesn't have the activities to do and therefore getting a little more agitated or restless or wandering. Um, so we, we looked into here where we tried to really um, create where that individual was coming here to do volunteer work. So came here as a volunteer, had a volunteer name badge, and they, of course they were at that level, they could do that. And then they felt really important and a part of being here one day a week and then they came twice a week and then they came three times a week and then little by little they became where they were um, doing what we could transition into adult daycare so they are here now and the caregiver was able to be able to take care of themselves while having this kind of a break for them and that adult daycare service then went on and on and it was for a number of days depending on what worked best for them and then all of a sudden that, that caregiver needed to take care of um, something for themselves and they had a medical situation. So then the individual came here for short-term overnight respite. So they started out at one day as a volunteer and then their adult day and then they do the short-term overnight respite for a week. And then what? it's time to move in full time. It was beautiful and natural and no problem at all. And, and I'm not going to say that works for everybody, but if the situation is right, then sometimes that is the most ideal, obviously, when you can do it very gradual. Yeah. So I'll have another family that'll say, absolutely not. If we get the person in the car and in the door, we're not taking them back out and we're not going to go through this each and every time. Because yes. That's a huge one. There's so many family members who are like, I can't even get my loved one to go in the car. And if I even mention adult day care or, you know, let alone the idea of a nursing home, it's like it's, you're not getting them to budge. So I think that's why we, we thought the volunteer aspect and approaching it from that direction worked out really well because the person was a volunteer in their life anyway. So that made perfect sense for them. Yes just continuing their role as a volunteer. So that we were fortunate in that. Yeah, I have um, one patient who goes to adult day health care five times a week and he goes to school. That's yeah. how, you know, he goes to school and he comes home and he has his like crossword puzzles or drawings yeah. or colorings or whatever he did that day and he brings them home for his family members and for his caregivers to show what he did at school. Yeah. The adult um, day center was so awesome that they even eventually held a graduation for him. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, like cap and gown. He had like a certificate. And so I think a lot of times, you know, families are hesitant. Of, oh, my, my father's not going to like this or my father's never going to go for this or my mother wouldn't like this. But it's right. like, you know, we, 
sometimes we can't really sell these um, centers short. Some of the staff, not always, but if you get a really good location with really great staff, they will work with your loved one. I mean, they are around people with dementia all the time, and they come up with these creative ideas that really make it more comfortable and more enjoyable. So. Yeah. Very good. We, we had a person similar to that that would not have come otherwise knowing the language that we use, right? So this person um, knew they had memory deficits. They were very concerned about it. It was, it was very um, um, aggravating to them. So we called this brain rehab. So he really liked the term of rehab and he was coming for brain fitness. And so when he came, it was about what was he going to do for his brain exercise because it was all about getting better in that regard. And so he was so focused on doing some of the adult coloring, um, or the, the word searches, some of the sorting, and things like that. And we were constantly adapting whatever he used to do with his cards and now making it, the, oh, the first time it was so funny because I wanted to test how much he knew. And so I said, okay, sort the red and the black. Okay, now sort the suits. Okay, now sort them in sequence by number. And then and then we got up playing solitaire. And the wife said he hadn't played solitaire for years. Aww. And the, the wife kept saying all these things that he would never do. She was blown away at the things we were able to get him to do. Because in his mind, he needed to do this because it was rehab. So that yes. It's important to pay attention to the words we use. Technology, yes. We use. Right. Yeah. Adult day health care versus, you know, rehab center or school or volunteer. Work. You know, there's such a different, you know, feeling behind all that. Terminology is key, I think, in, in what we do. Yeah, it's very important. Like here, we don't call them patients or residents. We call them guests because uh, God, I wanted them to feel like they were at a resort. So yeah. you have to match up whatever, you know, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish at, you know, with that. So languages, we go over all kinds of about the language here. So that's great. So yeah. I love it, like you just gave an example of like a really ideal gradual transition. Right? That's like best case scenario. But you know, the real world. Yeah. Let me let me take the real world now. So in the real world, when most individuals want to just select a target date and make the move there's a number of questions that always come up from family members. So when you're planning this with whatever facility you select, I really um, suggest that you take some time to figure out how you're gonna orchestrate the execution of that actual drop off, stay, and then the family leaves. So with that said, we had one family that said, do we bring them in and then do we slip out or do we say goodbye or how do you do the actual goodbye? Yeah. Every single person is different. We have seen times where the bringing them in, you don't want them to not say goodbye because then the person feels abandoned. But sometimes you have to do it that way. And it really is dependent upon the staff, the caregivers that are there to help distract that individual when the loved ones then leave. And then, and then you can say, oh, your family left. They said goodbye. They'll be back tomorrow. And then you go right into, you know, um, you know, just about how they had a pleasant leave, but the person can't quite remember saying goodbye. But um, so sometimes that slip out is important because otherwise they could have stood at the door and said, no, 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 and don't go. And it could have been quite a, a scene then. Yeah. And that's huge. I mean, again, like you mentioned, it's different in every case, right? But also with dementia, I talk a lot about how, you know, People with dementia, especially if you're at the point where you're considering a higher level of care, like nursing home, they're not able to process all of the information. And so they're really picking up on nonverbals. And you know that the family members dropping off their loved one, their nonverbals are not going to be as calm and peaceful and happy. You know, that They're probably going to be a bit anxious and scared and sad and all of those emotions. And your loved one with dementia is just going to be picking up on all of that. Sometimes in those situations, absolutely, the slip out might be, you know, what needs to be considered. That might be the best way. And again, you're always weighing the pros and cons. And, and then the second way is they often say that whole compassionate lie, the therapeutic bib, do we tell the truth or do we not? Again, 
it depends on every person, every different situation, because I've seen where both work beautifully. And in some cases where it wouldn't work beautifully, if you sat there and tried to tell somebody the truth, when maybe they wouldn't understand or accept that, then you're going to have to figure out a better way to do it that's in their best interest. Because we often say when individuals comfortable with what they call lying. Um, lying would be under normal circumstances. And this yeah. is lying in under these circumstances because it's not quite normal. So you have to say what is in the best interest of that person. So, yeah. And with that said, it just depends on where they are in their disease process and, and how you manage that to date if you have been doing some of those therapeutic fields or not. But um, I have to tell you, I have one that moved in and the, the daughter never, ever, ever wanted to tell her mom the A word also. And so she said, don't ever anybody say this because she doesn't know yet. Well, guess what? That was the most difficult transition ever because she could not understand why her daughter would leave her there. So that one day I broke the ice and I said, Dorothy, have you ever heard of the word Alzheimer's? And she said, well, yeah. My mom had Alzheimer's. Is that what I have? Do I have Alzheimer's? And I said, yes, you do, Dorothy. And she goes, is that why I'm here? And I said, yes, it is. And she goes, oh, well, that makes sense. So then everything seemed to be made more clear to her. Yeah. And she was much more accepting. And she, would, she had a different adjustment period from that day forward. And it was really about being truthful with her because they have a right to know their, their diagnosis. Yeah. And some people you can have that conversation with and other people you can't. Absolutely. I did a video on this a while back in terms of like, should you tell your loved one they have dementia? And again, it's always that individual. It, it's not the same for everybody, but for some people, it can just kind of have things make more sense and provide relief. And for some people, it's just going to lead to some argu arguments and maybe combativeness and some other struggles, right? So, but sometimes you don't know until you try. And if you're in a situation where somebody is constantly stressed or confused or not sure what's going on, well, that might be an indication it's worth trying something different. Maybe the approach of kind of avoiding that word isn't really working and it's worth a try. So, yeah, I love that example. You have to kind of experiment with that. Yeah, and the whole line thing, I mean, we could probably talk forever on that. I understand, you know, we grow up in a world where it's like lying is bad, lying is bad. But, you know, I, I always feel like lying, you're doing it intentionally to um, deceive somebody for your own personal gain. But right. doing compassionate lying is actually to relieve some sort of stress or anxiety on their behalf. So it's all about your intention behind it. Um, I had one care blazer tell me, um, I don't, I don't consider it lying to my loved one. I consider it lying to the disease. I have to work around the disease. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I thought so too. I'm like, oh yeah, I mean, you know, these care blazers out there just have such amazing like ways that they kind of work on these difficult situations. But yeah, you're absolutely right. A compassionate lie. I wish uh -huh. I had another word besides lie. Yeah, yeah, I've even heard fiblet. It's a fib <laughs> a fiblet. That's cute. <laughs> I don't know why you're, but the other thing um, with that actual day of move in too is that um, oftentimes there's this fear that it means like you're going in the front door and you're only going to come out the back, you know, and so it means like it's forever and this is where I'm going to die and, and things of that sort. So it can be very stressful when they think they're going to be here forever till the end and this is where I got to live forever. So we stay away from that completely and i'm fortunate just because of stone lodge and we can talk about it being on vacation and it's temporary or even when we were talking about the brain rehab um, it was just for a certain amount of time and um you know and and so we never made it feel like it was forever and then gradually the adjustment is absolutely wonderful i've seen so many that have just come to accept this as, as home and then all those other questions just kind of fade away and then they no longer ask about going home yeah so still working within that transition period when you're trying to figure out what is going to make most sense to that individual so they can be most accepting of it and it can be the most reassuring to them in that moment of great fear and uncertainty yeah i mean i i think it's important 
to understand there is an adjustment period, right? I mean, I, I think it would be pretty um, unnatural if there wasn't an adjustment period, right? Oh. The whole world is kind of getting yeah. changing for everybody involved. So um, I, I think sometimes caregivers or family members get really kind of start to question and second guess and doubt what they did because they see that their loved one's asking, when do I get to go home? Where am I? I don't like this place, but it's like, there's an adjustment period and that is normal. It is not, it, it's actually very rare for somebody to just go in and be happy, go lucky. Like, I don't think that's, um, that's not the norm and that's not what we should be expecting. Absolutely. We talk a lot too about um, that whole first visit. Do you stay away for a while or do you visit right away? And some people I think have been given advice to stay away. And I yes. struggle with that one because to me, that person, if it were you and that feeling of abandonment, I just, I, I really don't like that advice. Um, so I really like to think about, yes, they, they need to come soon and they need to come often and, and be a part of life here and not just a visit, an uncomfortable visit where you're sitting there and saying, what'd you have for lunch today? But really try to be a part of the life at the lodge. Oops, I've said the lodge. <laughs> 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 because um, we're trying to have families feel comfortable to be here as well so that it really is about again living life together and so yeah. visits have to be meaningful and then it's not as where you feel like you have to stay away because you're gonna um, create more of a distress with that said though we do have some family members that visit and it is a trigger yeah. for them because they can be just fine here and then that visit can really be disrupting things so again case by case we will yep. tell people that um maybe during this week we we just play it by ear and we'll let you know when there's a good moment or something and yeah yeah but again i love what you say you know it is a case by case because i have heard many times when some of my patients get ready to transition to a higher level of care that the facilities will say, stay away for a week, you know, bye, it'll be, it's like, oh, is that right for everybody? You know, not necessarily. Sometimes that family member brings them comfort, you know, and starts to, you know, normalize this experience and they can lunch together or whatever the case may be, watch a favorite TV show together. So it, it's not all about, you know, stay away for, there's nothing magical about staying away for seven days or 14 days blanket answer to any of this yes you that's what makes it so challenging and i think that it's really reassuring i think to hear for care blazers to hear like there it's no blanket answer it's different for everybody it's a challenge and you figure it out as you go you do the best that you can right absolutely yeah. and you learn as you go and it's up to the facility and the staff of caregivers to help you with that transition yes. um, to the best of your ability. And so we, we all want it to be a smooth transition. I'd like to jump back just a little bit because when, when sometimes people ask, well, when is the right time to make that move? Sometimes they think their loved one will never leave their home and don't want to leave their home because that's their home. And so when you look at that individual, you have to really evaluate Eating, they're not taking their medications, they're lonely, they're bored, they're depressed, they're isolated. So sometimes, even though we want to think home is so idealistic, really we have to go dig deeper and say, is that what's best? And so the transition, when you move someone into a setting like this that's more formalized, where all of those needs are being met, I have literally seen reawakenings because yeah. The person has friends and they're socializing and they're not alone and they, they are included and they belong and it's, it's a beautiful thing in many cases so yeah I've even seen you know it, it doesn't always work out this way but I've even seen relationships between the caregiver and the person with dementia become better because that caregiver now all of a sudden can be the daughter again or can be the wife again or can be you know this um, you know yeah whatever the case may be and they're not the person that's constantly doing all the care tasks they're not the person that's always saying oh you can't do this for your safety or you know because sometimes that that puts a big strain on relationships and the person with dementia starts to resent you because you're always in the way but now it's the staff's thing and you know the family members can just come and enjoy the company 
Absolutely. I have a recent um, example where there, this husband and wife, and she had um, young onset Alzheimer's. So she was just in her early 60s. Mm -hmm. The husband was trying so hard, but her disease was progressing rather rapidly. So he thought she would never, ever, ever go in a memory care facility. And much to his surprise, that first week, she loved being with the staff, being with the other people. She was doing activities that he had never seen her do. And when he'd come to visit her, he was literally shocked and amazed because it was the exact opposite of what he was imagining yeah. in his mind to be. And it turned out much better. So he was very pleasantly surprised. Yep, absolutely. Now you mentioned, you know, we all want that smooth nursing home transition or that smooth assisted living um, facility transition. And for some people, it's going to be really difficult. It's not going to be so easy. I'm wondering, are there things that you talk to family members about in terms of, you know, maybe bring in a couple of their favorite personal items for their room or what other tips do you have to try to increase the chances of that smooth transition? Absolutely. Well, I have two in particular that jump right out at me. And one is really key is about the life history. And what I mean by that is, is that we have a form that we have family members before they um, work with us on that handshake and we're in this together, tell us everything you can tell us about your loved one. We need to know because the more knowledge we have, every idiosyncrasy from what their interests are and their likes and their dislikes and what are triggers for them, what don't they so that we make sure we don't do it. So it really is all about sharing as much information as they know about their loved one to provide to us so that we can really set up what we call a service plan and some places call a care plan so that all of the staff members know um, everything they can about their, their loved one. And then secondly, as I had mentioned earlier, was about that expectation form. And with that, um, again, if it's not a smooth transition it's because maybe it's something we're doing that we're not meeting their expectation so you have to have that communication right up front and family members have to be comfortable with saying i expect this and then if it's unrealistic then the facility can um, tell you why it's unrealistic and then this is what you could expect and then it's, it's learning and sharing on both people's parts so that there's not those misunderstandings or misinterpretations. I think communication up front is absolutely key. Absolutely. So then, that dialogue, and, and if, um, and if you know, Careblazer, your loved one's in a place where they didn't initiate that dialogue or you're considering putting your loved one somewhere where it doesn't seem like that's happening, you can initiate that. You can let them know. Absolutely. What my loved one really likes this is what really tends to set them off like he really likes this is this possible for you to do like absolutely take charge of that and ask for those conversations i'm so glad you just said that about initiating it too because just because um i've been through it with my own dad and i know how i set it up with my dad and and i have the ability to set it up at this facility if i were a caregiver and i wasn't um someone who uh, worked facility one of the other things I would talk about with initiating um, when my dad moved into the nursing home I asked if I could gather up the staff and have 10 minutes of the staff's time I sat at the table and I put out pictures of my dad and I said let me tell you about the man you're about to have the privilege of meeting mm -hmm. told everything about my dad with the exception I didn't say anything about his incontinence his behaviors his medication any of that because I knew that was coming all in the medical chart yeah. So I told him about the man, the father, the husband, the coach, the business. You know, I just, I told him all the good stuff about the person that he was because yeah. I really want to focus on the person and not the label or the disease. Yeah. And so after that experience with my own dad, um, I set it up at my facilities where I give families that opportunity on move in day. Would you like to take a few minutes with the staff? And we gather the staff together and the staff love hearing that. So again, if the facility doesn't already have that, maybe as a family member, you can, if you're moving your loved one into a place, say, can I just have 10 minutes with the staff? And that's where you really talk about the handshake there. You know, Absolutely. So. Yeah. I, don't be afraid. I know it can be intimidating, right? But um, I think in the end, you know, the place you're putting your loved one, they want things to go as smoothly as possible too, right? Correct. Yeah. 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 So awesome. Um, so anything else in terms of the gradual kind of plan transition, finding a target date, making sure, you know, you're um, 
taking an individualized approach in terms of telling them or not, a lie might be needed versus not. Yeah, I just wouldn't rush through anything. Um, I would take the time to make sure that the, that the place where you're moving your loved one is well prepared in every regard as far as that actual day. And so in doing so, making sure that that plan is well coordinated with whoever that person is that is coordinating that with you. So, okay. and then there's the other transitions, the unplanned. And, and those are usually when there's a crisis or, or some traumatic event that happened that you didn't have the opportunity to take that time to plan. And it is one of those, okay, she's moving in in one hour, you know, and it's like, oh my. Yeah, so got to be able to make the best of those situations too. And um, with that, that's a little, you know, obviously the less preferred, but oftentimes um, does have to be dealt with because of the emergency um, nature of an incident possibly. Yeah, like, unfortunately, this seems to happen all too often. And it's either, you know, because the person with dementia suffered some really thing that now all of a sudden their ability to do what they used to do is no longer so the caregiver cannot you know manage that but yeah. what I see a lot is it's almost like the straw that broke the caregiver's back like the stress just mounted to the point where it's like I cannot take one more thing or you know I worked with a caregiver who um, you know just would did not want to consider any higher level of care really struggled with just that idea of respite or some of those other things you know and she ended up having a heart attack and yeah. he was there to care for her husband who was, you know, de fully dependent, non-ambulatory. And so he ended up, you know, at the very last minute, yeah. fresh decision going into a nursing home and, oh, those just those break my heart, you know, but they have all the time. Absolutely. So w when we look at um, the process, you know, as far as the when and what would cause that, Let's say, for example, going back to what I said in the beginning about safety, let's say something's really unsafe and they just went wandering outside their home and, and um, the police had to pick them up and, and then it was like, okay, we got to move them someplace right now. Well, there are other things to really work through too as far as some of the other interventions before that because I always want to believe that moving into a facility is last resort. Yes. There are all kinds of other alternatives to, uh, to attempt. For example, today with today's technology and all that GPS device and the tracking, oh my gosh, that stuff is, is amazing. And so you could prevent some of those emergent crisis situations by just starting to really identify some root causes of the greatest challenges that you're having. And so for example, another one might be like um, if somebody is getting um, more and more aggressive in their behavior. We know that oftentimes that's part of the disease, but oftentimes I say we're the cause of it. And the yes. cause could be the environment being understimulating or overstimulating, or it could be because they're just bored out of their mind, or it could be because they are in pain, and or it could be because they're not taking their medications for you. So we have to look at um, ways in which we can figure out what the root cause is and try to address those first without going all the way to the extreme with placement because sometimes those can be so adequately addressed, just like I was saying with the respite care too, so that the caregiver can take care of themselves as well as you know addressing some of these other issues. So the, the timing of when you make the transition, you just want to make sure that you've thought through everything. And one of the key things that um, I wish I would have done better as a daughter and my mom, we often, you know, hindsight, right? We often talk about we wish we would have had a journal to help us through with identifying those triggers. Yes. Whenever the doctor would say, well, how long has this been occurring or when did this start? I mean, we were always so numb that we couldn't answer any of those questions because you're living in it day to day. But what I tell my family members now is to have that journal so that you can go to the doctor. You have the best, most informed um, information for them to make their decisions with medication changes and so on and so forth. But then you can also look at at ways in which you've attempted this intervention and it didn't work or it did work or we adjusted it or adapted it and so it the journal is really really key to help you through the process as well so 
Yeah, I love that. I love so much about what you just said. I love number one that you just because somebody's safety might be a bit at risk or something's changing, it doesn't mean nursing home is like the next step. There are so you know, it's basically like problem solving. Okay, how can I, you know, try to manage this situation or what can I do? What new tool or resource or you know, anything like that. It's not always about rushing to the higher level of care. Um, right. And I also love, love, love that you said we sometimes create that behavior in our loved ones with dementia. We don't do it on purpose. You know, caregivers are doing the best that they can, but, you know, we're looking at it through our own eyes that we're not really seeing it from our, our loved one's eyes and their brain and perspective that sometimes unintentionally the way we respond or the way we look or the way we're managing something um, is really what setting our loved ones off. So I, I love the idea of a journal. Um, I've even made a couple of handouts in terms of tracking, like what was the situation? What happened immediately before? Who was around? What was your loved one doing? You know, what was the behavior? Because sometimes it takes that detective work to figure out, oh, you know what? It always seems to be like right before he has an accident or it always seems to be like, you know, 15 minutes before dinner or, you know, so you start to try to figure out what the common themes are and then intervene for that. But it's always a hard one to say that you're causing the, yeah. the fear, but it really is great because it means, okay, there's hope now and trying to intervene and reduce this. Yeah. I, I often, um, when I'm training my staff and things and the families, and we always talk about how do we prevent and avoid a situation, a behavioral reaction versus managing and reacting to it after the fact. If we're really in that preventative, proactive mode, you are going to be that Sherlock Holmes and you're going to be trying to solve the mystery with identifying what that root cause is or that trigger. And then when you find that, then you can either eliminate that trigger so that it doesn't happen again. And so you're always trying to like figure out how to prevent and be one step ahead so that you don't have to just react, always react after a fact. So and it takes time, you know, it doesn't have, you don't figure it out the first time, maybe not even the fifth time, but you know, you stick with it and you know, you just take that detective approach and eventually, yeah, you find yourself preventing, um, preventing a lot of these things from happening. So yes, I love all of that. <laughs> But with all that said, you know that the disease does progress and, and um, when somebody, when you've exhausted all your alternatives and you know that the 24 hour care setting, be it assisted living or nursing home is the best option, know that it, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you failed or it just means that that's just where you are with doing the best that you could in the time, you know, and, and that those settings are there for that purpose, and so yeah, there's so much good to making that decision too. I don't want it to, you know, seem as though it's last resort from a bad standpoint, but there can be good to that as well. Absolutely, it is not a failure at all. In fact, it's actually the thing that's absolutely necessary to maintain the safety of your loved one because. I mean, a lot of the people I've met, they don't have a lot of extra support around them or have, you know, they're trying to raise their children as well as manage a parent and take care of their loved one, you know, but keeping their job, managing a household. I mean, at some point we have to realize, you know, we're human and our emotional and physical well-being is important too. And right. that's what these places are here for. You know, not everybody needs them, but a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And sometimes when you think you're doing what's best for your loved one, when you're killing yourself in the process, it really might not be what's best for your loved one. After well, all. That, exactly. Some, you know, sometimes I ask some of the, you know, care blazers I talk to, I'm like, if you kept this up, like, how are things going to look in, you know, a year from now, three years from now? And for the most part, you know, it looks like the care blazers health is going to be worse than their loved ones. Right. And then if something happens to you, who's going to be there for your loved one? You yeah. have prioritize your own self-care. I know it's so much easier said than done, but it's just, I mean, in reality, if, if you are the one caring for your loved one with dementia, you have to take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. And some of the opportunities that are afforded to your loved one then by being in a place where there's a lot of resources from the standpoint of staff and activities and you know, things like that, that um, again, they're going to be um, 
well off being able to be out there watering the flowers. We had people yesterday in the garden boxes picking vegetables to bring in to take into the kitchen. Well, if you're doing that alone in your own home, you're not going to have the energy or the resources to be able to do some of that. Whereas here, I do have an opportunity for a greater degree of well-being in that regard. So. Yeah. Now, what do you think of the idea? So sometimes I work with family members and they, you know, they have kind of have that seed in their back of the mind that eventually, you know, they might need a higher level of care, but they know they're not ready yet. And so sometimes I talk to them about, well, you may never need it, but right. it's hard to prepare and start to do some research now and investigate a couple of places because sometimes when you wait until that last minute, it becomes that kind of unplanned emergency situation and you end up putting your loved one in whatever facility has an opening at that time because there's wait lists and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, th I think like you just said, the key is about planning and preparing. And sometimes that's tough to do if you're imagining that I will never do this and they'll never need this and we're going to take care of that, them at home, you know, for as long as, as we possibly can till the very end or I made that from that promise to never put them in a nursing home you know oh my goodness that that dreaded promise you know uh, never ever do that <laughs> uh, because there could be like we said some great opportunities with going into a nursing home but but as far as um maybe feeling like you'd never need it still always being planned and prepared is always going to be your best bet yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I did a video a while back ago on that whole nursing home promise, you know, like, you know, caregivers have promised their loved one to never put them in a nursing home, but they made that promise at a time when they fully believed they could provide that care. But, you know, none of us have that crystal ball to predict the future. And sometimes that decline just happens so uh, suddenly or, you know, the, the needs become so great that at this point, you realize you can't you would never make that promise. And so sometimes things change and, you know, that's life and, and it's okay. You know, at, at some point you have to, con you, like you said, those three things you consider in the beginning, you know, safety is one of them and so is the caregiver's health. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, this was so helpful. Anything else you think that um, Careblazers would find helpful in terms of how to make that nursing home decision, when, how to make the transition smoother, any last parting? Um, um, Maybe I would have to say um, word of mouth with um, te family testimonials. And I know that in today's world, we have lots of reviews to look at. But those are absolutely key. You're going to want to know other people's experiences. And, you know, you might be looking at a review that um, might be a bad review, but there might be other circumstances that was involved with that. Maybe it was the person, the family member who was difficult themselves, you know, but, but I still would um, think that it'd be really important to ask whatever facility that you're researching, if they could provide some testimonials, if they could provide um, what training their staff gets, um, if they could provide things as far as like uh, what typical day like or can I spend time at the facility there's so many things to do to, to really look at um, whether or not you think that place would be a good match for you or not um, you're going to want to feel best about it because you did your homework on it and I always say that my um, family members are my best um, marketing my report cards so um, they'll tell you what it's like and so, yeah Nothing better than word of mouth, right? That's the best marketing. So hopefully being able to talk to other people who have family members there or who had family members there. Um, I love the idea of spending time there, asking to kind of, you know, spend a day, see how things are going or what's a typical day. So yeah, yeah, it just goes back to kind of doing research and asking questions and not being afraid. I mean, after all, you're putting your loved one in this place. So, Mm -hmm. So, um, Mary Jo, I know you mentioned you're in your sensory room um, of your facility, and I love the backdrop. It is gorgeous. I think that there might be some people out there, though, that don't quite know what a sensory room is or what it's used for. Can you kind of give us a little tour and share about how you use it and what you've noticed it's done for the, um, your guests? Absolutely. Um, this is my favorite room in the lodge and partly because it's a room that really where we try to bring the outdoors indoors and it really promotes relaxation and rejuvenation and just this sense of uh, multi-sensory from the standpoint of I have a heated massage reclining chair and yeah. 
And we have a video where we just play nature videos, um, you know, with awesome waterfalls and things like that. And then we have the aroma machine and we have a huge fish aquarium. So I'm gonna turn myself around so you can see my fish aquarium that was built into the wall here. How cool. So hopefully you can see that. And yeah. on, the other, on the other side of that is the dining room and the green room. And so the fish aquarium serves where both sides of the aquarium is best utilized. And so it's an absolutely beautiful room. The other thing, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm gonna try and see if it works. My, my stuff, oh, I don't know if you can oh, see. Oh, I see that they're lit up, the stars. Yeah, we have our ceiling that is all stars. And then, um, so in this room, we're really working a lot with individuals who might be starting to become aggressive or restless or agitated in some way. And so we try to bring them in here to do that, prevent for it becoming all the way to extreme. Or if they're already to that point where we try to de-escalate. And so we try to create that calm and we're doing hand massages and you know we have all kinds of different sensory things that we do in here to help that individual and, um, the other thing that we do is uh, the hymns and uh, the hymns are very important to share because we have so many people here that absolutely connect on a very spiritual level and they might no longer have the ability to speak with language and communicate and I have one individual that we brought here um, that is a reawakening story like no other, but uh, she was brought into this room and she hadn't spoke for a very long time and we had her in the heated massage reclining chair. We had a, a video in of just hymns and she sang out loud every word to every song. And he sat next to her crying because he said, I haven't seen my wife that alive in a year. And I know we've all seen the videos of what music does and with the headphones and the iPods and the music and things like that. But this room just really kind of took it to that next level for her. And um, so that was very special. On the flip side of it, when we have individuals like, let's say that might be um, more apathetic because they're just sleeping all the time, we like to bring them in this room to maybe heighten that a little bit. So depending on what the person needs, where they need energizing or relaxing, we try to focus on that in here. So we have the, the happy light, the light for those individuals who have seasonal affect disorder, and we try to experiment with their depression and their mood with the happy light and then with more upbeat type of music to energize them a little bit. So, so we use it um, in many, many different ways depending on the person and how we can um, benefit with a variety of different you know, interventions. Yeah, I love it. There's a lot of research out there that talks about how, you know, um, stimulating the different senses and engaging them can really have a positive effect on people and sensory rooms in particular for kind of that agitation. Like once you, the earliest point you see that's kind of mounting, consider like doing something like this. And there are bits and pieces that caregivers at home could take from this, you know, put a music or um, popular music from their teenage years or even kind of the essential oils, putting them in like a, yep. You can get those aromas machines just anywhere. Yeah. The other thing that was fun for us is that projector. I just bought that off Amazon and it lights up the ceiling. And I had one lady that moved in here and the first four nights here, she would not go into her room. But she slept in this recliner chair because of the stars on the ceiling that we put in. So every night thereafter, we moved the projector into her bedroom and that's how she fell asleep. So. It, it was kind of fun to see that she really liked that and she just, oh my gosh, her response to it was wonderful. Oh, you are truly a gift to this adventure world. I feel like the personalized approach you take, like being really creative and innovative in terms of like trying to figure out and get to the bottom of what's causing somebody's distress and then just the creativity and, that you put into creating a home-like environment, a cozy environment a place where loved ones, you know, family members and people with dementia can feel comfortable. I, I think it's wonderful. I'm so happy our paths are that you're willing to share your time and expertise with us. 
Oh, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. I, you know, I was so blessed because actually it comes with um, extra blessings because this was a vacant church. And so when I walked into the church and saw the ceiling, I said, well, I have to make this like an up north lodge. And so I'm going to just show you the ceiling just real quick so you can yeah. see our living room out here. And then others can go on Stone Lodge's website and look at it. I'm um, going to show, I'll put a link to it below this video so they can go take a look. So here's, can you see the lodge in the fireplace? Hi, yes, it's beautiful. Oh, they're waving at you. <laughs> yeah. oh, look at the beautiful high ceilings. Hello. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so I was just going to just show you that real quick, but they can look at that online. Yeah, absolutely. I will link to um, the Stone Lodge below the video in the description. You can click on it, and I'll also show some um, some of the video uh, during the introduction of this one. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Mary Jo, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm so glad to be here. I love to share whenever I can. Yes, awesome. Wonderful. Thank you.